thank you. And, and uh, please uh, forgive my being late. It's George Bush's fault. Uh, well, the Republicans are sitting over here. Okay, all right. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, uh, I don't know what Alan told you uh, about my background, um, but if you didn't mention it, uh, this is a special uh, treat for me and pleasure to be back in this building because, uh, what is this, 19... 2007? Okay. Uh, well, 2008, what am I saying? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, 30 years ago, I sat where you're sitting. I was an undergraduate uh, here. And uh, I don't know how much things have changed besides the building of lots of, uh, or the construction of lots of buildings on campus uh, since that time. Um, but I, I guess this is nice for me because it feels like coming home. I am an old blue like all of you, and uh, I love being here. This is a real treat to be back on campus. Um, the subject of uh, my talk with you today is uh, the subject also, maybe uh, uh, Alan mentioned uh, a new book that I've, I've done recently, and it's also uh, very much what I do uh, in, in my research uh, and in my writing uh, at San Francisco State University and also for CBS News. And that has to do with how uh, politicians communicate uh, with constituents in this day and age um, as they approach political campaigns. And I think the way I'd like to start my discussion about that with you is to ask, if I could, just out of curiosity, um, how many of you are registered to vote? Let's see a show of hands. Good, very good. How many of you are not registered to vote, if you're honest? Okay, shame on you. That's all right. <laughs> How many of you are planning to vote in the primary next Tuesday? Okay, that's a smaller number. That's interesting. I'm going to talk a lot today, but every once in a while I want to ask a question, so if you'll indulge me, maybe you'll answer it. For those of you who didn't raise your hand, why aren't you going to vote next Tuesday? Anybody? You're an out-of-state resident? Okay. So you would if you could? Are you from a state that has absentee balloting? Mm hmm <laughs> Okay. You raise your hand? You're from, what's that? North Carolina. Okay. You already voted absentee. All right. Anybody else want to answer that? Go ahead. You voted absentee? You don't have a strong opinion about Clinton or Obama? Okay. You leaning one way or the other? You know what? Can you share with us how you're leaning? Leaning Obama. All right. Out of curiosity, how many of you in this group would say you're Democrats? How many of you would say you're Republicans? Okay. How about uh, independent? All right. You know what? That actually kind of, not quite, but kind of mirrors the numbers that you find uh, in the state of California. There's actually a larger number of Republicans than are represented here. Um, the perception in California, by the way, is that it's mostly Democratic. And uh, that's not actually true. One of the things that's important to know, at least about the way we vote in this state, and then I'll talk about the nation and get back to talking about how the candidates communicate with us, um, in California is that uh, uh, the, in terms of voters, the, the number of people um, who are independent, right? And we call them fail to state, uh, you know, they, they, they decline to state a party. That's how they register. Um, it's actually grown in the last uh, eight years. And it's now close to 20% of the electorate, right? One in five. That's a big number. That's a big number. Um, and otherwise, uh, there are, depending upon where you are in the state, slightly more Democrats. Uh, than Republicans. Um, but that's for all registered voters. The numbers that politicians, especially those who engage in the kind of stuff I'm going to talk with you about today, who do communicating with uh, their constituents and campaigns, the numbers that they pay attention to aren't registered voters necessarily. They're interested in what are called likely voters. And perhaps you've already talked about this in class before, but if you haven't, the difference between registering and being likely uh, to vote is the difference between saying I could vote and likely voter I will vote, right? 
And when we get down to likely voters, here's something kind of interesting given the numbers that we had in this class. Turns out in California that Republicans are actually more likely to vote than Democrats. Not by a lot, but by a few percentage points. And uh, uh, Democrats, in turn, are more likely to vote than independents. Right? Not by a lot, but by a bit. So in this class, by way of example, therefore, if you remember when you saw all the hands go up, that means that even though most of you in this class are Democrat and a sizable number of you are independent, and I think there are actually more Republicans than independents, but let's just put the Democrats and the independents together just for the sake of this argument, right? The truth is, statistically at least in California, and we find this trend in other parts of the country as well, that actually Republicans are more likely to turn out on election day. Of the existing crop of candidates we have in the presidential race this year, some of you indicated support, for example, for Barack Obama. I didn't actually only ask you that question. Let me ask the class that question. How many of you are, are planning on voting for Barack next Tuesday? How many of you are planning for voting for Hillary Clinton? <laughs> we got the bumper sticker. Okay. How about John McCain? A couple of you. Mitt Romney? One lonely soul. Mike Huckabee? Ooh, okay. Ron Paul. One person, two people. Dennis Kucinich? He can still write his name, man. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, you see where you, you can see where the support is. Well, it, it looked to me from what I saw with the hands going up that Obama probably in this class, for example, had the most sizable number, uh, had the largest number of people voting for him. Statistically, statistically, um, if Obama's going to win next Tuesday, he needs those of you who raised your hands to actually bother to vote. Historically, though, we know that the likelihood of that is not great. The fact that Obama did well, for example, in Iowa and has done well in some other places is very much a testament to the fact that he actually appealed to people, primarily people your age, not only to mobilize to work for him and to give whatever money you could afford to give at your age, but also, most importantly, to bother to turn out and vote. Right? And the truth is, historically, and this is from time immemorial, since we actually changed the voting age in this country back in the 1960s, which made it possible for 18-year-olds who were being sent over to Vietnam to also vote, right, back at that time, that the historical trends are that uh, people age 18 to 34 historically vote in much smaller numbers uh, than, than people over the age of 35. And by the way, not even close, not even close to the number of people uh, over the age of, of 55, they vote in mass. It's because they got all that free time on their hands. And they also have a worldview that maybe you don't have yet, possibly. So, as a way of introduction to talking about, again, how they communicate and thinking about audience, for those of you who do care about next week, right, if you raised your hand when I said how many of you are thinking about voting for Barack Obama, one thing that you want to think about uh, is the fact that Obama very much relies on the support of people like you if he is going to have a chance in this campaign of beating Hillary Clinton. Or if he becomes the nominee, if he's going to have a chance in this campaign of beating uh, whomever the Republicans put up. Right? Can't do it without the generational support of people your age. It's not going to work. Interestingly enough, if we go to the Republican side, the same thing is true. John McCain, who appears to be the Republican frontrunner right now, right, he's got some momentum, actually has done very well in a way that's similar to Barack Obama by appealing to people who aren't uh, traditional voters, independent voters in essence, right? And getting people to cross over who are registered Democrat, maybe to vote for him. Well, that doesn't happen very often. More often to get people who aren't registered to vote or who are first time voters to vote for him. Right? And he needs the support of those people. And he does well, very well in those states that have open primaries where independents can vote. Now, for those of you who raised your hand supporting uh, McCain in this class, you know if you're Republican uh, that next Tuesday only Republicans can vote in the Republican primary. Right? The independents aren't allowed to do that. But the Democrats are a little more open to this. And so for those of you who are independents in this class, you can vote in the Democratic primary. It's not easy, but you can. But McCain is also someone who relies on the support of people like you, being not traditional, right? 
And the sad thing in some, to sort of leave this talk about, topic about who votes and who doesn't, is that nationally in this country, in spite of the fact that we privilege and pride ourselves as being the example of democracy for everybody else on the planet, right? Voter turnout in this country is shockingly low. It's really low. Many times less than 60%, sometimes, depending on the election, less than 50% of registered voters, right? Not everybody's registered. You saw that in this class. So I'm just talking about people who are registered. And that means that when somebody wins an election, let's say that you even get 60% turnout nationally, right? That means that when somebody wins an election and gets more than 50% of the turnout, well, what's 50% of 60%? And now we've got to have some math majors in here. What's 50% of 60%? 30%, right? That means less than a third of the electorate is selecting a leader for 100% of the people. Yeah. That's not very good. It's not very good. But in our system, the right to vote includes the right not to vote. That's the way it works. Now, how does that relate back to communications? Well, from my perspective, from my perspective, what that means is that when candidates and their campaigns engage in communication strategies trying to reach voters, right, they're already aware of the fact that there is a built-in degree of voter apathy out there, people who don't vote, people who decline to vote, people who don't care. There are all sorts of reasons that people don't vote. It can be inconvenient. People your age, by the way, typically say a, a variety of things, such as, I'm not sure that it matters at my age, or I don't know that, that I'll make a difference if I bother, or, you know, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm kind of concerned with getting through life at this point, and that sort of seems like something I'm going to worry about when I get a little bit older, right? There are all sorts of reasons people don't vote. But the truth is, the truth is, uh, you don't, typically. I hope you prove me wrong next Tuesday, but you don't. And the campaigns, by and large, are aware of that. One of the things that makes Obama's campaign unique this year is that he has tapped into a consciousness for young people. He does talk to you, absolutely talk to you. But most of the other campaigns don't, right? And you might think, as young voters, that that means they don't care about you. And that's not quite true. Politics and campaigning is, at the end of the day, a game. It's a contest. And the object of the contest is to win. So you look at what resources you have, you look at what's necessary to win, and you operate your campaign according to that. And if it turns out, for example, that people 18 to 34 don't vote, then you don't waste your time on them. It's not that you don't care, it's that they can't help you if you're running. So their messages to people like you don't deal with the issues maybe that concern you, right? They're not talking about the stuff that might be a priority for you. They don't speak your language. Who do they talk to? The people who bother to vote. In the modern era, modern campaigns and the messages and the, and the communication strategies are very much a battle for the votes of those people who are likely to vote. Right? And if you don't like that, and I hope you don't, I hope I'm pissing you off a little bit, then what you need to do is become one of those people who's likely to vote. That's how you get their attention, right? That's how you get their attention. Now, uh, if I were to sort of bridge from that now to talking about the current political season, if you like, and how this all works, let me give you the quick and dirty version of what it's all about. Make sure I brought my wallet, hang on. When I've taught classes on this before, I have students always ask me, okay, so if you had to explain this, Joe, pretend that we're from Mars, all right? If you had to explain this in just 60 seconds or so, what would you say about you know, American, the American campaign system? How does it all work? And I thought about that the first time someone asked me about that, and I said, okay, well, it's about this. This is how it works, all right? I'm holding up a $10 bill for inflation. What does that mean? Well, it means a couple of things. Here's the quick version. Right? In our system, we don't really have meaningful term limit rules. We have term limits, but there are always ways around them, everywhere, at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level, anytime you have term limits. The only effective term limits are those for the president 
and the vice president. Because, man, when they're done after two terms, they're out of there. And if you've been president, you're not going to run for anything else. Right? You might think about it, but there's no job of king or pope or something like that you can run for. You're done. <laughs> but all the other jobs, all the other jobs, if you get termed out of your office, you just look for another office to run for. We have produced generations in this country of what are called professional Pauls, P-O-L-S, period, which is just short for professional politicians, people who make it their career to be elected officials. That doesn't mean they're bad people. It just means that's their job. That's what they see as their job. Public service is their job. They become, the first time they're elected, the incumbent. And the first thing you need to know about how the system works is that the job, the first job of an incumbent, the first job after you get elected is to figure out how to get reelected. Because you want to keep it going. Enter this. And if we're doing the podcast, I'm holding up the $10 bill again. Right? Incumbents have a built-in advantage when they run for office because institutionally we provide them with all kinds of resources that help them to tap into and communicate with voters while they're doing their jobs. They get offices, they get staffs, we pay for websites, we pay for their travel back to their district to visit voters. Right? Everything they do if they're a high profile candidate is newsworthy so they also get news attention. And that means if you're already an incumbent, you've got all kinds of built-in advantages that the people in the policy department will tell you is what's called incumbency advantage. Right? Hard to beat an incumbent for that reason. But all the resources that we give them don't necessarily pay for all the expenses of an actual re-election campaign. We do have campaign finance rules in this country. But here's the other little dirty truth that I'll share with you besides the fact that there aren't really meaningful term limit rules in this country. We also don't have, despite all the best intentions, meaningful campaign finance restrictions either. It is all about this. The money that people use to run campaigns has to be privately raised. There are some federal matching and state funds available, but it's a limited amount. If you want to run a big campaign, you need private donations. And although there are rules for how much people can give you, there are always ways around those rules. Always. The problem with effective campaign finance restriction is that the people who pass the rules about that in state legislatures or in the United States Congress are the people who benefit from getting money. And they have not to this point, with apologies to Senator McCain for the McCain-Feingold Act that he helped pass, found a way to pass legislation that's bulletproof, that can't be gotten around. There are always ways around this. Now, you might be asking, OK, so they get money. What does that mean? Are you saying they put it in their pocket? No, they don't. When candidates raise money in this system, they're not crass about taking it as a bribe. That's not the idea. I mean, there might be a few knuckleheads who do that, but by and large, that's not what people do. What they do is they take that money and they use it to run their campaigns. Nobody who gives money to a campaign in this era, despite what you might have heard from people who have conspiracy theories in their head, actually take money for bribes. And nobody who give money to do that think that they're bribing a candidate or an elected official. What money gives you in our system, in the American system, is access. If somebody gets in, you have access. That means your person or you personally can get in front of these people and you can give them your agenda. Your lobbyist will have access at the, at the appropriate time. Willie Brown, the former mayor of San Francisco, also, by the way, a professional Paul and a friend of mine, once said when he was asked about this, any damn fool, and I'm paraphrasing Willie, who thinks that just because they give me money, I'm going to vote for them the way they want, you know, is a damn fool. He actually used a few more expletives in between damn fool and <laughs> what they think. Right? He said, all they get is access. I'll consider what they're saying. Now, that's fair except when you consider the fact that that means only people who have money get that access. People who don't, don't. That's the part of this that's kind of not so OK. All right, so what do they do with that money? Well, for the purposes of running an election, they spend it. They have a staff. They hire professional staff members to help them communicate with voters. Right? They have to pay for travel expenses. They need consultants to help them with their strategies and all the little details. Most of these campaigns outsource a lot of the jobs of a campaign to specialists. Many of these people, by the way, in modern campaigns are people like you, young people. 
As a matter of fact, one thing I might parenthetically share with you about campaigns in the modern era is that of the different mediums that campaigns use to communicate with voters, in the last decade, computers and the internet uh, as a form of mass media, the internet, the World Wide Web, has increasingly played a more important role than it used to. It's not as dominant as television at this point. The television is still the best way to reach voters. But the internet is kind of creeping up there. And that means that modern campaigns need people who are technologically literate. People who know how to work the internet. People who can create websites, maintain them. Uh, people who understand blogging, how to create a blog. Young people like you who know how to create content for YouTube. Video or text. And maybe some of you, I'll bet many of you in this class, because nowadays, heck, you don't need a digital camera to do this. You can do it with your damn phone, right? Right? How many of you have accounts on Facebook? Show of hands. <laughs> I should ask the question differently. Who doesn't have an account on Facebook? Yeah, about 10 people. OK. <laughs> I think I made my point. Right? Everybody can do this now with one of these. You just point it and click. Shoot the video. Shoot the stills. Upload it. There it is. I have a 20-year-old daughter, by the way, and a 17-year-old son. And I recently discovered their Facebook pages. because. <laughs> They were dumb enough to have used my laptop and left a link on it, kind of said. <laughs> Click. Boy, is my daughter in trouble, let me tell you. <laughs> She's a junior at Santa Cruz, or she was. <laughs> and I let her out of her bedroom all, well, anyway. All right, then. <laughs> Got to be careful about what you post. That stuff's going to follow you around all your life. Be careful. Anyway, campaigns look for that stuff, right? Because increasing, you saw the number of people who raised their hands when I said about Facebook, right? That is the way that your generation communicates. And you know what? In two years, if not in a year, that'll be passe and they'll be on to the next thing that's kind of like that. Facebook is the new thing. Before it was, what was it, MySpace, MyPage? Who even remembers anymore? That's what the high school kids use, right? And probably YouTube is replacing Facebook at some level now or they'll merge or Bill Gates will try and buy one or the other and, they'll, and you'll all get sick of it and you'll create your own thing, right? You'll call it CalBook or CalPage or whatever, right? But you know what I'm saying. Campaigns pay attention to this, and they need people, and this is one of those types of things that they outsource and, and pay for. They need people who are technologically savvy that way and can think of ways to communicate with voters using that kind of technology. All right, so those are some of the things that campaigns spend that money on that I was just talking about, right? But the biggest thing that campaigns use their money for at the end of the day is what we call in the business paid media, P-A-I-D, paid. Advertising, for lack of a better term. If you're running a small local campaign to sit on, uh, I don't know, the rent control board in Berkeley, right? the advertising that you're buying is signage. It's the little annoying things you put on people's uh, doorknobs to remind them to vote. It's the, the sign that you might get somebody to put on one of the buses or at a bus stop or, or a sign in somebody's yard or a bumper sticker. It's signage, that's what that means. And that's not cheap, it's expensive. If you're running a regional, larger campaign or a national campaign, the kind of paid media that we're talking about isn't printed stuff, although there might be a little bit of signage. You held up an Obama sign before, right? Or a Hillary sign, where was it? One of those, right? But if you're gonna reach a national audience, you can't do it with just one of those signs, right? If you're gonna reach millions of voters, you have to use a medium that hits millions of voters at the same time. Now, like I said, Lots of you use the internet, and the internet is very popular. But the majority of people in this country today get their information and therefore form their opinions about politics from television, and primarily from television news. Also in a campaign, however, from television advertising. Advertising in television and television coverage on the news is pervasive. It is the best way to reach voters. If you're going to run a campaign, you need to have someone on your staff who creates what's called a free media strategy for you, which creates opportunities for you to be covered by people in the press. That gets your name out there. And then you also have to have a lot of money, sometimes as much as 90 cents on the dollar. Every dollar you raise, 90 cents is going to go this way to pay for your paid media, your advertising. Now, in the modern era, 
modern campaigns who are going to communicate with voters blend their strategies. See, what you want is a combination of free and paid media to reach voters. That's the way it works. When you don't have a successful blend, you usually lose. Allow me to illustrate with a contemporary example. You all know that Rudy Giuliani dropped out of the campaign today and threw his uh, uh, endorsement behind John McCain, right? Okay, what did Rudy do wrong in the last four or five weeks? Anybody? What did he do wrong? He didn't campaign in any of the smaller states and thought he just campaigned in Florida. And what was the consequence of that for him? No one knew who the hell he was by the time they started campaigning in Florida, so they voted for uh, John McCain and the uh, Romney guy. And the Romney guy. <laughs> the Romney guy, I like it. Okay, it's essentially right. What the former mayor of New York missed in this year of a compressed election cycle where all these primaries got pushed together at the same time, right? was he missed out on all the free media. By sitting in Florida and just focusing on Florida for all that time, he allowed four or five, as much as six weeks to go by, where everybody else was running in caucuses and primaries. And yeah, it's true, there were only a handful of delegates up for grabs, so who gave a damn, right? But the news media was covering it. They're desperate for a story. There's a lot of interest in this election. That's why many of you raised your hands. You're interested, right? And what did we talk about on television, in the news, or in the newspapers, or in the blogs online? What did we talk about? The people who were running. The people who was up, who was down. Obama does this, Clinton does this. Huckabee says this, but he still wins. Even Ron Paul gets a few votes. Everybody's talking, right? Who are we not talking about? Rudy Giuliani. He was like Waldo in that game. Where's Waldo? Where's Rudy? I'm over here in Florida, <laughs> right? Fighting Islamic fascism. <laughs> Right? <laughs> Smoking a Cubano <laughs> right? and finishing in third place. There you go. Poor Rudy. He did not blend his strategies. He needed free media. He didn't get it. The only free media he got, he got in the last week, and it was all negative. All the stories about Rudy Giuliani were, was this a dumb idea? <laughs> Should you have done something differently? It's negative, frankly, right? So he threw all that money into Florida for nothing got to blend your strategies. The free stuff matters too. But, and this is the thing I hope you get out of my talk today, when you are a candidate and you're running your campaign and you're trying to communicate with voters and you are relying on the free media, you still have to have the paid media too for a very simple reason. You cannot depend 100% on free media because you're not writing their columns for them. You're not editing the video that they shoot. You're not inside the web bloggers who's writing that influential blog about you. You're not inside their head. They make those decisions. You can have your talking points out in front of them. You can stage an event that they come to to cover, and, and you may, may they maybe shoot some video of you giving a speech or something like that, but you don't know how they're going to edit it. You don't know what they're going to focus on. Right? Poor Giuliani, the other day, he, you know, he went to a, he, he had a Sunday morning press conference. I think it was with Bob Schieffer from CBS, where I work. And Schieffer ambushed him halfway through. So do you, he, say, he said that question. Do you think it was a dumb idea to stay in Florida all this time? And poor Giuliani thought he was going to get a talk, chance to talk about why he should be president, right? That's Schieffer's decision. He's a chief correspondent for CBS, right? You can't control the content. That's the point. Now, in show business, we always say, look, any news about you is still good news, right? So Lindsay Lohan's getting out of the car and she's not wearing underwear. It doesn't look good, but you know what? We're still talking about Lindsay Lohan. Keeps her name out there. So Britney Spears has some kind of breakdown and does funny things with her hair. Okay, but we're still talking about her, aren't we? Her music's crap, but we're still talking about her, right? So you could say, Joe, well, well, all right, so maybe people weren't talking very nicely about Rudy, but at least they were talking about him. Okay, that's true, but only for a couple days, right? The bottom line is you still need that coverage. Even if it's bad, you need that coverage because it keeps your name out there. But if you're going to be effective, you have to control the message, and that's where the paid media, the advertising, comes in. It is the most valuable resource to a campaign because it's the only kind of 
situation where you can control 100% of the message. And that's why campaigns love it. And now I come back to the way I began this by talking about this. Advertising, television advertising, is very expensive. You have to pay to produce it and create it right, for the content, and you have to pay through the nose to buy space, to buy airtime. Very expensive. We are in the fifth major media market here in the San Francisco Bay Area, right? I know because my contract will be up for negotiation. Well, I hope they're not going to hear this. Is this podcast? Oh, I can say this. My contract's up for negotiation next year. And, you know, every time I, we have to negotiate a new deal, the station manager always comes out and says, oh, you know, you know money's tight. That's all you do. I don't think we can do much better than 5% from last time. You know, right? Well, I know for a fact that this year, this station, like every station, is rolling in cash because there's a huge amount of interest in the election. The ratings are through the roof for political coverage. I'm making him money. <laughs> I know that, right? And what that means for you, I mean, you don't care about what I make, but what that means for you is that they're charging a lot for that advertising because they know they can get it, because people are watching. And that means from the perspective of a candidate, it's worth spending that money because you're going to reach a lot of people. Right? Now, the other sad truth about this advertising that I hope you remember about today is that Okay, so, my, so campaigns are reduced to, everybody wants to run, they come to get reelected, they need money to buy advertising. Okay, Joe, we got that, right? The other sad truth about this is uh, that most of that advertising, unfortunately, like most of the campaigning in this country, is negative. Here's the difference between negative campaigning and negative advertising and positive or affirming campaigning and positive advertising. When I campaign in a negative way, I tell voters, Vote for me because the other guy is an SOB. Right? And that means if I run an ad, I run the ad about the other person and I tear him down. And by inference, I look better. If I run an affirmative or a positive ad, it's all about me. Here's what I'll do for you. When I'm doing negative, it's all about why the other person is worse. Mitt Romney ran eight times as many commercials as John McCain in Florida. The majority of them were negative. Right? We had an unusual result in Florida. Romney lost. That actually goes against the usual trend. The usual trend is that negative wins. Negative wins. May not be the most ethical thing. It may be the thing that all of us say that we hate. Voters always say that they hate negative campaigning. Journalists say that they hate it. The candidates say, I don't want to do it. But the bottom line is it produces election victories. If we had more time, I could give you 10 examples, but just trust me on this. It works. Campaigns, like I said before, are there, a campaign is a game. The object is to win. And as long as you're technically legally within the rules, you can do that. Right? The First Amendment, by the way, according to the Supreme Court, has been interpreted in numerous cases to allow people to say things in advertising that they probably get sued for if they were talking about private citizens. But in an election, because public officials are sort of in a different place, it's almost impossible for them to sue for slander or libel. And so in campaign advertising, they get away with outrageous, I mean outrageous, claims. The courts have said, for the sake of democracy, we want more voices, not less. We don't want to make rules that restrict what people can say. So we're going to allow this cacophony of voices, even if some of what's being said is not so okay. And we're going to trust that voters will understand the difference. Well, the truth is sometimes we get manipulated. Too many of us, unfortunately, watch TV and we don't read. And it's pretty easy to get manipulated. Okay, that is the state of affairs for today. Am I supposed to take questions at this point or are we almost out of time? Okay, <laughs> well, before I let you go, let me say this to you. I will take questions in the back, and there are copies of the book if you're interested in more about this subject. Let me encourage you very much to, if this bothers or concerns any of you, get involved in this. And I don't mean this just sort of as a platitude that I'm throwing out at young people. There will be things that these people will decide that affect you. If you think the draft is not still on the agenda for some people, it is. And by the way, for women in the class, next time around they'll draft women. 
If you think that federal spending for education is not on the table, including for people like yourself, it is. Please get involved. Thank you so much for having me today.